Good morning, Grace Bible Church. It's great to see you all again. I have the great privilege of preaching today uh, as Rick is gone with his family, along with uh, many others from Grace, uh, on their annual church camping trip. And I trust that they are doing well as Russell Dixon brings the word to them this morning. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This morning, in God's holy word, we will be talking a lot about the Christian's identity. And so I've titled this message with a question. Do you know who you are? When I was 13, I was swimming for a year-round swim club team called Poseidon Swimming. And I distinctly remember my coach's voice as he gathered me and my three other relay team members after we had just been crushed in an 800-meter relay. And we had finished last by over 20 seconds. But my coach wasn't mad that we had finished last. No, he was upset that we had given up. We had forgotten the point. And he asked us, do you guys know who you are? Do you know who we are? We're Poseidon. We don't give up. Coach Mike was reminding us of our team's identity. We swim hard, we swim fast, we don't quit. Sometimes we need to be asked that question. Do you know who you are? Do you know your identity? We live in a society where everyone wants an identity. We have an identity crisis, so to speak. There are confusions about identity, Social media demands that you identify with one side or another, and that becomes your identity. Everyone needs to be classified and defined according to their preferences and desires, and it creates this chaos. We can forget who we are. And this might seem like a problem for the world, but it's also a problem that plagues the church as well. And not just churches today, churches in Paul's day. The Corinthians had an identity problem. So Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is going to help us answer this question. Do you know who you are? Our main point today is this. Be defined by your God-given identity. Know that your true identity is defined by God. And we will see this in the text of 1 Corinthians 1 through 9 by examining two prompts that help you know your true identity as a believer. Our first prompt is this be reminded of your God defined identity. Turn with me now to verse 1 as we examine the first three verses of this book. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To unpack this prompt, we must see that Paul desires the Corinthians to be reminded that their identity is defined by God and his calling. Paul is going to do this starting out even in the very beginning of his letter, in the standard opening. And this is helpful for us, too, because in a world with many identities, we forget our own. We forget who we are in the stress and difficulty of the week. So let's begin at the beginning and dive into this letter to the Corinthians. And to do this, we're going to look at two components in these first three verses, the letter part and the reminder part. First, the letter. This letter is like all of Paul's letters, and it has this standard Roman Greek opening, this this standard greeting form uh, at the beginning of, of, of all these letters that we see in the New Testament. 
And today, our standard greeting form when we write a letter or send an email is this. Dear Steve, dear Marcy, well, in the ancient Mediterranean world, the, standing, the standard greeting form was this. Who the letter is from, who the letter is to, greetings. And that's what we have here. Paul, to the Corinthians, grace and peace to you. Paul, however, is going to add his personal flavor to this greeting. And this twist on the standard greeting is important. Paul is telling us in this greeting, in, in this greeting information that he wants us to know. He's already teaching. And it's not accidental. It's, it's masterful in many ways. And these three verses, even down to verse 9, will serve as a subject line for the whole letter. Paul intentionally writes here in these nine verses about whole subjects that are going to come up later. Look now at verse 1. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Right off the bat, Paul is telling us about himself. He's telling the Corinthians who he is, and he's identifying his authority. And he does that by saying what? By saying that he was called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul's authority to write a letter to the Corinthians comes from his apostleship. And he's an apostle because of God's unavoidable calling on his life. Paul saw the light literally. Paul was specially commissioned by God to be an apostle and to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. That compulsion would make Paul later say in 1 Corinthians 9.16, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. God's call on our lives is like this too. If you're a believer, you have a divine calling. And we'll get to this more in a bit. But what does it mean to be an apostle? It means that Paul's authority comes not from a lofty position, but through the witness of the resurrected Christ and a life that's been transformed by the cross. He's not saying, I'm an apostle, clap for me. He's saying, I'm an apostle, listen to me. And really, the Corinthians should listen to Paul. After all, Paul founded the church in Corinth. Apart from his time in Ephesus, Paul spent more time in Corinth than any other place, nearly 18 months of teaching and establishing the church there. They should be intimately familiar with him and his calling, yet it's clear later in 1 Corinthians that they were challenging his authority and seeking out knowledge and titles and identities that were counter to the truth that Paul had established them in. So Paul writes very clearly and lays out his authority so that they can see that it's not Paul the man speaking, it's Paul speaking under the calling of God's will. Remember that there's this standard structure to the Greek letter. Name of the author, Paul. Identification of the reader, the Corinthians. Then the greeting. Well, here, in the identification of the reader, Paul does something that he doesn't do in any of his other letters. He goes on an extended description of who they are. Nowhere else does Paul do this. So we have to ask why. What's the specific purpose that he's doing here? He's saying, look, guys, I'm Paul the Apostle. Let me tell you who you are. Let me remind you of who you are. I have a lot of things I need to talk about with you in this letter, but it starts here first. I really need you to see who you are first because you guys have been messing that up. You've forgotten your actual identity. So let me remind you of who you are as a church and as a believer. What does this look like for us today? Can the same thing happen to us? Can we forget who we are? Christian, do you know who you are? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does your life look like? What is your identity? Are you a Christian? Often, the daily grind is truly that. It grinds away at our identity. Sin creeps in. We entertain temptations. We start to desire what the world desires. We become apathetic. 
And maybe you weren't even that grounded in your faith to begin with, and so it's just super easy to just float away. We need to be anchored in our true identity. You need to be anchored in your true identity. And so Paul actually uses the envelope on this letter, so to speak, to start teaching and correcting the Corinthians. And he starts by reminding them of their identity. And today, he's reminding us of our identity as well. So let's look at this reminder of who you are as a believer. There are four truths in this reminder that we see in verse 2. Here, verse 2 again. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. The first truth of this reminder is right there at the beginning. To the church of God that is in Corinth. <clears throat> the church of God. Whose church? God's church. You see, the Corinthians were a status-hungry people. They craved names and titles. They were proud of themselves. They were proud of their knowledge and spirituality. And they considered themselves mature. So Paul starts out by saying, look, your church gathering is not about you and what you know. In fact, it's not even your church. It's God's church. It's God's possession. It's not Rick Zaman's church. It's not John MacArthur's church. It's not John Piper's church. It's God's church. It's his people. You're God's people. You're one body. You're one gathering. Your identity starts there. You're a people of God's possession. He is your God, and you are his people. This is the first part of our identity that we must see. If you are a Christian listening to this right now, you need to know that the first part of your identity as a believer is that you belong to God. You're one of his people. You're in his family, and you're a part of his church. If you're a solo, Lone Ranger Christian, or if you're not tied and committed to a local gathering of God's people, then you're going to struggle to see this first part of your Christian identity. God saved a people to himself. He didn't save a bunch of random individuals who aren't connected to anything. If you're not locked in with a local church, you will eventually have a Christian identity crisis. Paul repeatedly in 1 Corinthians talks about the church body and how they're all one. And he even talks about the different ways the local church identifies its own members. Here at Grace Bible Church, we have membership. Not so that we can be divisive, but so that we can all know who is truly in this local church of God in Midlothian. And if you're not a member, that doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. Not at all, right? But it does mean that one of the key parts of Christian identity is missing in your life. There's not a category of Christian in the New Testament for someone who is not committed to a faithful local church of God. And the book of Acts is especially clear on this. Those who are saved and profess Christ become part of his church and the local gathering of his people. Membership in a church is purely a clear profession of faith in the submission to the teaching and discipline of that church. So, if you belong to God and you're one of his people, then you need to be gathering and committed with the rest of his people. Whether that's here at GBC or at another faithful gathering of God's people, God's people gathered together make up God's church. And Paul starts out his reminder and identification of the Corinthians by telling them who they are as a church. And what a blessing it is to be a part of God's family and with his people. What a blessing it is to gather with God's people. And how can this be? How can we be the people of a holy, perfect God? That's no small thing. How do we as sinners receive such a marvelous blessing in this relationship with God? This is where we see the second truth in this reminder of our identity. Look at verse 2. 
to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. The second truth is that we have been sanctified in Christ. You have been made holy in Christ. Your identity has been fundamentally changed. Because of Christ's work on the cross, our identity as an unholy, sinful being has been transformed to be holy before God. We can now enter and enjoy his presence. We can now have a relationship This transformation is not because of something that we have done or even do now. It is because of Christ's accomplishment of salvation. Sanctified, as it's used here, is talking about a past event with present effects. This sanctification, holiness, refers to the one-time event where Christ's blood washed away the sins of his people. 1 John 1.7 But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Hebrews 10, 14 and 17. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And God says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Christ's death on the cross wiped clean our slates. His death was for us. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. His blood cleanses us. The one-time offering of the Lamb of God has perfected his people for all time. Christ's death cleans us. Christ's resurrection declares us righteous before God. And God will remember our sins and lawless deeds no more. God, transcendent in majesty and purity, looks at us soaked in the blood of his son, and says, holy. Not because of anything we have done, but because of what Christ has done. Holiness is received, not achieved. So what is Paul's point in reminding the Corinthians and us that we have been sanctified in Christ? Well, Christians are defined by Christ's work. Are you? Does Christ's work on the cross define your identity? The implications are enormous. Paul is reminding us that this is who we are as Christians. We've been set apart and made holy. And the sad irony for the Corinthian Christians was that they were indeed sanctified and washed in the blood of Christ, but their lives looked like everyone else's in Corinth. Do you live out your consecrated status for the whole world to see? Are you bold? Does your life look like it's been transformed? What does your identity actually reflect? Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, look, be what you already are. It's a reminder that's almost a rebuke. Recalibrate your identity. The greatest price in all eternity has been paid to make you holy. You've been sanctified by Christ. Paul is quick to point out, however, that there are two sides to this sanctification coin. In one sense, there was a one-time transaction that fully sanctified you before God. Yet, there's also another sense where sanctification is an ongoing process. Here's the third truth in this reminder of our identity as believers. Look again at verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Called to be saints. Or as the Nazbe puts it, saints by calling. We are called to be holy. Be reminded of your calling. Believers are called to a lifestyle that reflects their already given status. 
This is talking about the ongoing process of sanctification. The Greek word for saint and the Greek word for sanctification both come from the same root, and that has to do with holiness. Saints refers to living Christians, not dead ones. And unfortunately for us, the Catholic Church has has twisted the understanding of that word. But the reality is, is that all Christians are called to be saints. All Christians are called to be holy. Why? Because Christ has transformed us. Our lives need to correspond to what has already been done. This is ongoing sanctification. It's a process. It's step by step. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Sanctification is about being transformed into Christ-likeness. This is about the pursuit of holiness because we serve a holy God. Our calling to be holy is unavoidable. God's call is not something you take or leave. Like the call for Paul to be an apostle was unavoidable, your call to be a saint, to be holy, to become what you already are in Christ is unavoidable. Think of it this way. When a person becomes an officer in the Marine Corps, they commission, meaning they receive their rank before they actually officially assume their position. Yes, they are a Marine officer by rank and title, yet they haven't lived up to it yet. This is like the sanctification process. Christians have been commissioned. We've received the rank of holiness before God's presence, yet in a very real way, we are not actually fully sanctified in our life here on earth. We still sin. We still battle temptations. Ongoing sanctification, fighting sin, growing in holiness is a defining mark of your Christian identity. Paul challenges the Corinthians because he knows that they're not living up to this calling. Is this your identity? Is this your calling? Do you own this? Does your life reflect your status in Christ? We grow in sanctification through many means, but we must stay anchored in God's word and the prayerful reliance on his spirit to help us grow and fight sin. Without that, we are hopeless in our fight with sin. I think too often we try to grow in our sanctification by ourselves. Yet God has given us a whole family to help us grow in our pursuit of Christ. Find a faithful brother or sister who will help you fight your sin and keep you faithful in the word. That's, that type of accountability is crucial. We need to be reminded of the call to be holy on a daily basis. Believer, your identity as a Christian needs to be marked by your calling to be a saint. The final truth And the reminder of our identity as Christians is that your identity and calling is bigger than just you. It's not all about you. This was Paul's message to the Corinthians. Verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. The Corinthians were self-absorbed and self-centered. They acted as if they had a monopoly on Christ and the Spirit. They thought, in a sense, that the world revolved around them. And Paul's response to this was, snap out of it, guys. Your identity is the same with everyone else who calls Jesus Lord. You don't have some special status or prestige. In fact, the idea, that idea is antithetically opposed to your Christian identity. That's a valuable reminder for us. We join in with every other true believer who calls Jesus Lord. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. No one can truly call Jesus Lord except in submission and humility, and that is found only in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
Our identity is shared with each other and with God's people throughout all time and space. And our identity is not better because we sing modern worship songs and old hymns. And our identity is not better because we have expositional preaching. Our identity is not better because we have a specific, precise doctrine that's carefully considered. No, our identity is shared with all God's people because we all call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for other churches because of this. We pray for them that they would hold fast to their identity in Christ, and we hope that they would pray the same for us. Hopefully, this is a reminder for you to be thankful for your gospel-believing brothers and sisters who go to different churches. But maybe this needs to be a reminder to not judge harshly those who God sees as his people because they call upon the name of the Lord. If God sees their identity in Christ, then so should you. So to summarize what Paul is saying here in this greeting, Paul is saying, look, Corinthians, look, Grace Bible Church, you need to be reminded of who you really are. You need to see your identity. You are God's church, not your own. You're made holy, not because of anything you've done, but because of Christ's work. Your calling is to be holy and live a life that reflects your status in Christ. Your Christian identity is not better or superior to anyone else's. The Jesus that you call Lord is the same Jesus that all believers call Lord. This is what your true identity is as a Christian. GBC, this is your identity as a Christian. Know who you are. Paul moves on and concludes his opening with the standard Christian greeting in verse 3. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And there he's, he's bringing himself in and tying himself with them and saying, look, right, this, is, this is God our Father. We're together in this. Paul's next direction in the letter is to give thanks for the Corinthians in verses 4 and 9. And this is where we see the second prompt for the believer. Paul is doing the same thing here as he was doing on the envelope. Part of, and, and part of the letter that he's trying to communicate to the Corinthians, it's still about their identity. It's another teaching moment. In one sense, he's reminded them of their identity, and now he's trying to show them that that identity is all they need. It's complete. They don't need to add anything to it. They shouldn't add anything to it. So this is our second prompt this morning from verses 4 through 9. Be complete in your God-given identity. Paul is going to show the Corinthians that their God-given identity is the only thing that should define who they are. And that goes for us, too. We should not be looking towards anything else to be defining our, or, or adding to our identity as believers. And the way this will unfold in verses 4 through 9 is, first, we're going to look at Paul's thankfulness, and then we're going to see five marks of the complete Christian identity. See now at the beginning of verse 4, where we see Paul's thankfulness. I give thanks to my God always for you. Paul starts out by expressing thanks. This is, this is standard in, in all these letters, right? Except for the letter to the Galatians, Paul starts out by doing the standard greeting and then expressing his thankfulness for these people. And as he does this here, he shows us the extent and completeness of the Corinthians' identity. Paul's thankfulness isn't sarcasm. He's truly thankful. But he doesn't reflect and and put his, his thankfulness on the Corinthians. He's thankful to God. And there are three functions for this thanksgiving here at the beginning of the letter. It reminds the Corinthians what Paul has already taught them before. 
It communicates Paul's care and concern for a church that has serious problems. And we'll get to that in a second. And it also introduces the main themes of this letter. But let's look at why Paul is thankful. And it's actually almost shocking that Paul would be thankful for this church. The Corinthians were a church that had a lot of huge issues going on. And it's helpful to know a little bit of the background on Corinth to really see these issues. Corinth was one of the most important port cities in the Mediterranean. It was prosperous. Many different people from all over the Roman world were there. Corinthians were said to have a fiercely independent spirit. They craved status and titles and knowledge. Corinth was also infamously known for its vice and enticements. The Corinth of Paul's day was the Las Vegas of the ancient world, so to speak. In the Corinthian church, though its people matched the, diverse, the diversity of the city, there were Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, rich and poor, the problem was that their lives were also matching the identity of the city. There were many divisions and factions in the body. The church was plagued by sins and carnality that even outsiders in the city condemned. Paul's letter served to address many of these divisions and immoralities that were taking place, and yet Paul starts out in his letter by thanking God for the Corinthians. Why? Paul is thankful for their true identity. Paul looked under all the layers of titles and identities and sins that the Corinthians had put on over themselves, and he stripped all that away, and he saw the Corinthians' true identity in Christ. And Paul was thankful because of what God had done. And he was trying to show this to the Corinthians as well. In verses 4 through 9, Paul is saying, hey, I'm thankful for what God has done for you. I'm not cool with these other identities you guys have, but I am super thankful for the underlying most important identity that you have. I'm thankful for your identity in Christ. And that's all you need. You don't need any other identity. Your identity in Christ is complete. So what Paul is going to do in this Thanksgiving is contrast much of what the Corinthians would claim for themselves by showing what God has done in them or for them through Christ. Grace has been given to them by God. They had been made rich by God. The true testimony of the gospel in them has been confirmed by God. They've been called into fellowship with Christ by God. And Paul is thankful to God for all of that. How about you? Are you thankful to God for the believers in your life? If Paul was thankful for the Corinthians, despite all of the sins and, div and divisions that were present in their lives, then surely we can do the same. When you see a brother or sister in Christ and you can't believe that they posted that thing or that they voted that way or that they follow that person or that they reacted that way or even if those things might be unwise, are you thankful for them? Are you thankful for their identity in Christ? Do you love them as Christ loves them? Are you willing to forgive the way that Christ has forgiven them? Even when your brother or sister seems to forget their identity, be thankful that God doesn't. So out of love and humility and, and thankfulness, remind one another of who you are in Christ, of who we are. Be thankful the way Paul is thankful. Be thankful for God's work in others. Be thankful that if they are a believer, they have been sanctified by Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit is sanctifying them even now. The more godly we are, the more thankful we will be. 
back in verse 4, we see that Paul is continually thankful because of the grace of God which was given in Christ Jesus. Paul isn't thankful for anything that the Corinthians have done or earned. He's very clear about that. He doesn't commend them for any of their love or their unity or their faith. But he is thankful for God's grace in their lives. He's thankful for God's gift in the gospel and how that has manifested in the lives of the Corinthians. And this is the first mark of the Christian's complete identity, God's grace. Grace, by its very nature, is a free gift. It's not earned. That's the wonderful, amazing, marvelous thing, the marvelous mystery of the gospel, that God would choose to save sinners whose identities were hostile and opposed to him. As sinners, Our identity was that of a child of wrath. Our identity was that of a dead person. We were dead in our sins. Maybe that's you right now. Are you dead in your sins? Is your identity hostile towards God? Do you love your sin and hate God? All of humanity faces this problem. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all fail to meet God's holiness. God is a holy, just God, and by no means will he clear the guilty. He can't just ignore sin. He will be just and pour out his holy wrath upon all ungodliness. But God... Being rich in mercy. Being a God full of grace and love has made a way for sinners to be made right with him. To have a relationship with him that's of love and not of wrath. And God has done this in Christ Jesus. God sent his only son to die a death he did not deserve, and to take upon himself the wrath of God so that there could be a payment for the penalty of sin. And why? Why would God do this? God, for our sake, made him sin to be who knew no sin so that we could receive the righteousness of God. You don't deserve that. You can't earn that. You are a sinner, and the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Salvation comes through the grace of God. Christian, you have been declared righteous by God's grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a sacrifice by his blood to be received by faith. How do you receive this marvelous gift? If you could earn it, it wouldn't be a gift. It's impossible to earn. You can't work your way to heaven. Your sin is an eternal barrier between you and God. The only way to receive this gift is through faith. Repent of your sin and believe in your heart and you will be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. If you've not done that yet, your identity is of the world. Your identity is bound for eternal punishment. Repent. Believe the gospel. This is good news. Find your new identity in Christ. This gift is freely offered. Now is the acceptable time. Today is the day for salvation. If you are not right with God, get right with him now. Paul anchors us here to this identity. This is why Paul is thankful, because of God's grace, because of the gift of salvation. As a Christian, God's grace defines us. Your identity is a gospel-changed life. There's nothing else you can add. Yet too often, we, like the Corinthians, have a destructive desire to find and add other identities to our, our lives. 
Look further down at verse 12. Paul is talking to the Corinthians about these other identities that they're adding to their gospel identity. And they, they, they pop up right here, right after this reminder. Verse 12, each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? They were saying, I'm a Paul-following Christian. I'm an Apollos-following Christian. Is that the gospel identity that they were supposed to display? No. They were adding things to their identity that were actually taking away from their true identity. Do we do this? Yes, all the time. We find our identity in our work or in our schooling or in the types of things that our kids do. We take good things and prioritize them wrongly and make them our identity. You're not a mother first and then a Christian. You're not a dad first and then a Christian. Your identity doesn't come from your relationship or your marriage. You're not a Republican Christian or a health food Christian or a homeschooling Christian. We do this too with our theology. We seek our identity there. We find our identity in our church before we find it in Christ. Brothers and sisters, we must find our identity in Christ and in Christ alone. When our identity gets hazy, we need to come to Scripture, come to this passage. Remind yourselves of your identity. It's complete. Anything you add to it takes away from Christ's work on the cross for you. You're a complete Christian. You don't need to be married or have kids or make a certain amount of money to be complete in your identity in Christ. You just need to be wholly resting in the grace of God. We've seen Paul's thankfulness for God's grace. We've seen the completeness of God's grace. In verses 5 through 9, we see how God's grace gives us a complete identity. The second mark that we see is in verse 5. That in everything you are enriched in him in all speech and knowledge. As believers, we are fully enriched. We have been made wealthy. We have a newfound inheritance of incalculable value. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Through Christ, in every way we've been made rich. Not materially rich, This isn't isn't a name it, claim it rich. This is spiritual richness. Paul specifically draws attention to speech and knowledge. And these were things that the Corinthians were specifically interested in. And Paul is saying that in Christ, you have spiritual speech and knowledge that you can't find in the world. You don't need the world's speech and knowledge. You have God's speech and knowledge supplied by the Holy Spirit. A transformed believer has words provided by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in God's word gives us a knowledge that is complete and tells us everything that we need to know to live the Christian walk. So don't seek out others and other things to add to your identity. Be content with what God has given you. The third mark is that God's grace in the gospel is confirmed in our lives. Verse 5 again. In every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. The speech and knowledge given to us confirms our identity in Christ. The gospel, our testimony, is confirmed by the speech and knowledge given to us at conversion. Your desires have changed, your speech has changed. Once you confess something else as your king, but now you confess Jesus as Lord of your life. This speech and knowledge are the mark of a converted person, and it's witnessed by everyone around you. The fourth mark, 
Verse 7, so that you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that you are not lacking in any gift. Believer, your identity in Christ as a Christian is complete. You're not missing anything. If you're a believer, then God has given you every spiritual gift you need. You're complete in your identity and calling. Why would Paul feel the need to make this point? Well, the Corinthians had a special fascination for the spiritual gifts, for both the ones that have ceased and the ones that last until today. But in many ways, the way that they were practicing their gifts was not in the way that God intended at all. This reminder is good for us today as well, especially if you feel dissatisfied or unhappy with God's calling and gifting in your life. You might be tempted to say, if only I had this gift, I'd be complete. If, all, if only I had what that brother has, then I'd be happy. Well, brother and sister, you are entirely complete. When you were transformed by the blood of Christ, you were given every gift God wanted you to have. So be content with God's sovereignty over your gifting. In verses 7 and 8, we see the fifth mark of the Christian, complete Christian identity, an eagerness for, Christ, for Christ's return. In every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's people are looking forward to the day of his return. We are waiting for Christ to come back as king. If you're a believer, you know you're standing with God. God's people will be blameless on that day of judgment, not because of their own merit, but because of Christ's righteousness. Are you ready for that day? Are you living as if Christ's return is imminent? Are you ready? As believers, we know that we will be confirmed on that final day when Jesus finally and fully completes his plan for judgment and salvation. But if you're not saved, and if you're standing guilty in your sins, you have no such hope. Believer, are you living in eagerness for an eternity with Christ? Or are you too preoccupied with the busyness of life? Paul tells us here that a necessary part of our Christian identity is an eagerness for Christ's return. So a Christian is someone who's been given God's grace, who has been enriched with spiritual treasures, who eagerly awaits the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed, who will stand shameless on that day. How does Paul end this wonderful passage? He goes to God's faithfulness. How do we know we will be confirmed on that day? Because of God. God is faithful. God guarantees his promise. Our surety comes not from our own identity, but from the God who defines us. God is faithful. God's faithfulness has brought us into his family. We have a joyful fellowship with the Son as fellow heirs to the kingdom. We will live with God for all eternity. Christian, if you're listening this morning, know your identity. Paul had to remind the Corinthians of theirs. And Paul did so because he loved them and wanted them to solely rest in God's grace and faithfulness. They were forgetting their true identity. Christian, don't forget your true identity. Be reminded of how you are defined in God. See God's faithfulness to hold you fast and keep you until the end. Praise God that our salvation and our identity is not secured by us. It is God who saves, and it is God who gives us our new name, child of God. It is God who has called us into fellowship with his son, and one day, one glorious unimaginable day, we will truly understand what it means to be defined by our relationship with God. 
Revelation 21.3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. One day, we will never struggle to know our identity ever again. Our true identity as Christians is eternal and complete in God, and we will forever be his people. Let's pray.